let's get into the word. I'm going to start by just telling you a couple of stories. Um, back when I was a teenager, there was this time that we went to Alton Towers where it was when Oblivion, you know, the roller coaster Oblivion, you may have you may have been on that or at least heard about it. When Oblivion first came out, and we were so excited. We were excited because it was Alton Towers. We've been there before, we knew how great it was, but we were we were extra excited because we'd never ridden on Oblivion. It had only just come out. And so um but it had been it, it was a hot day, it was the middle of May, June kind of time, and uh, I was with my friends, and so we're, we're, we're there on towers. We've been queuing in queues all day, getting hotter and hotter. And there'd been a number of, of rides just breaking down. And so eventually, we worked up to, we got round to going to Oblivion. We queued for Oblivion about two hours. And as we're getting close to the, the end of the queue, this friend of mine, a guy who I'd queued up with, there was just me and him, he just turned to me and said, Luke, I'm sorry. I really need the toilet. Well, I just said, I said, ah, okay. Well, look, um, we've got two options here. Uh, you can take the chance, or, or you can go to the toilet and then queue another two hours to go on the ride. Let's take the chance, though, eh? Uh, because I, I didn't want to give up my space. I've been queuing there two hours. I'm going to wait for him. Um, I didn't want to get split up from him. So, anyway, I managed to convince him we got on this ride. And as you know, if you've been on it before, it's going up. It goes up initially on this incline. It click, 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 click. As we're going up, this guy is just getting more and more agitated. And he's saying, look, I, I need a toilet. I really need a toilet. I need I need a pee. I really need to go. I, I, I don't know. And we're getting closer and closer. I don't know if I can hold it. I don't know if I can hold it. And then you get around the bend and you get to the end where it tips forward and you're looking down, you're about to go down, it's exciting and there's this anticipation of the drop. Well, in that point, as well as the anticipation of the drop, this guy shouting, no, no, no. Like he, I, I genuinely thought that he was going to pee himself. And on the way down, I, I, he had short shorts on, and I'm thinking, well, we're all going to get covered in this guy's pee. I had serious, serious doubts that I was going to get off this ride without this, um, without being covered in this guy's urine. Anyway, fortunately, the guy managed to hold it, and we got off the ride, and uh, and off he went. We went and found the bathroom. Um, but I just, I, I, on the way down, I had had no faith that we were going to make it through. I genuinely just doubted our ability to get to the end of that ride without being um, subjected to that and so um, so it wasn't a very nice experience another time I was working in a school and uh, I was delivering our teaching lessons and um, my wife Leah uh, she was going for a scan and uh, we'd offered in and stuff and I wasn't allowed to go with her and I was nervous for her for those of you who know my history you know that you know had some problems um with with some previous pregnancies and so i was i was genuinely worried about what was going to happen and i wanted to be there for her if something bad happened and so um i said to to the guys at the school my boss to look said i, I get it if you if he's saying i have to stay then i will stay but I, if i get a phone call from my wife i need to answer it i'm going to pop out the classroom and answer it and so they said okay so in the middle of this lesson my phone rings and it's leah and so I pop outside and I answer the phone and I'm like, is everything okay? Are you okay? Is the baby okay? And Leah pauses and she says, uh, yeah, they're, they're fine. They're absolutely fine. And it takes me a second and the penny drops and I'm like, what, what do you mean they are fine? Shouldn't you be saying it's fine? Why are you saying they are, they're fine? Are, are you saying we're having twins? And then she's like, that's what I'm saying. It's twins. And I just couldn't believe her. I couldn't believe her. For the, for the majority of the conversation on the phone, I just wouldn't believe her. And by the end of it, I mean, I know Leah well enough to know. She doesn't, um, I mean, she she, she, may, she may she play pranks occasionally. She's not really much of a prankster. And, and if she did, she wouldn't last that long anyway. And uh, and genuinely, by the end of it, I was like, "This is this is real. This is for real." <laughs> but initially, I just I just thought you you're pulling my leg. You're having a laugh. I just I doubted. I doubted what she said. 
when we when we uh, bought the house that we're currently in, we've been here for two years now. Um, there was some stuff about it that Leo wanted to to change, and I made some kind of promises as the husband. Don't worry, when we get in there, I'm gonna I'm gonna do those things, and we get get it done really super quick. Don't you you just watch, love. And she said, I don't, ah, <laughs> yeah, I think you think that's going to happen, but I know what's going to happen. We're going to get in there and life's going to be just full and it's going to be busy and we're going to struggle to get things done. And in a few years time, we're still going to be things that I want to see happen and it's not happened yet. And I'm like, have some faith in me, love. Well, she had a, uh, turns out a good reason to doubt. I mean, over this, um, over this isolation period, I've probably done more in the last two weeks in the garden than I've done in the in the uh, in the two years that we've been living here. So she had a right to doubt, I suppose, and that. But you know what? Um, I was out walking just the other day, and I was praying. And as I'm praying to God, I was really struggling, and I was saying to God, God, I I can't seem to get going. Like I start to pray, and then something takes over my mind, and and I, and I I can't seem to stay on point and stay on focus. And, um, you know, maybe you can relate to this, but you know, my mind was taken over. So, you know, when you have like, uh, maybe you have an argument with somebody and you're replaying it in your mind or you're anticipating an awkward conversation, you, you're going over what you might say and what they might say, and, or, or, or the, maybe you've just got lots of things you're planning or working on or whatever. And all these things are going around my mind and, and pull me away from praying to God. I said, God, I said, I, I, I'm sorry. Like, I'm genuinely, I'm sorry. I just can't seem to give you um, the focus that I want. And it's been this way for a, for a, you know a couple of weeks now. I'm just really, really struggling. And um, I felt like God say to me, "Well, just take a step at a time." And um, and so uh, I literally did that physically. So I took a took a step, and I would say something about God, you know, in, in, a, in a worshipful way or, or whatever. And so I, I took a step and I say, God, you are my Lord. Okay. Take another step. God, you're my saviour. God, you're my companion. I say, step. And I, I, out, say out loud, I was in the middle of a field. No one could hear me, so it wasn't weird. And so I'd say, God, you're my Lord. I'd take a step forward. And before a thought could go in, I'd say something else. God, you are my friend. Take another step. God, you are my healer. Take another step. Uh, God, you are my provider. Take another step. Then it changed it. God, I love you. Step. God, I need you. Step. And bit by bit by bit, you know, I just, one step at a time, I was able to have that communication with God. And that's sometimes what it can be like with faith. You know, God wants us to just take a step, a step, and a step at a time. But, you know, often in our, our brains are clouded with things like doubt. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, doubt. Um, we're looking at this this whole series called Ascension, where it is focusing on the days after Jesus was resurrected from the grave, uh, but before he goes up into heaven. And I don't know about you, but if, if I died and I was given another week, two weeks, um, just to say whatever I wanted to say to people and to do whatever I wanted to do, I'm pretty sure I'd make that time count. And so we really think these things that Jesus said are really important, and this is a good thing for us to study together. And one of the things that Jesus focused on um, in this period is doubt. And so we're going to read together John 20, verses 19 to 31. If you were been following us in the, the devotions in the week, then you were, were already done this. But I'm going to bring out something different and really focus on what Jesus was trying to get across. So uh, John 20, verse 19. said, so on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. 
A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here. See my hand. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Great portion of scripture. I'm just going to take a moment to bring some stuff out of this. The first thing is that uh, Thomas, he wasn't in the right place. Uh, I don't know what he was doing, but it says that when Jesus showed up, he wasn't there. Now, I don't want to make assumptions. I mean, Thomas could have been out doing the shopping for everybody, for all I know. He could have been out taking a walk, so he needed to get away. He could be doing a, a hundreds of different things. But one thing I know, everyone was there, worshipping or whatever they were doing, and he wasn't. And the first thing I want to mention about this passage and to do with doubt is that it's so easy for doubt to creep in when we aren't surrounded by our Christian family. It's so easy for doubt to, to creep in when we're not surrounding ourselves by things that are encouraging for our faith. If we surround ourselves with things that are negative and will pull us down and, and will affect our mindset in that way, that's what we're going to see. You know, that the, 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 you, you'll have the fruit will come out of the seed that you plant inside you. So make sure you're where you're supposed to be. If you want to be a person who doesn't doubt, get around other people that don't doubt. Get around reading that doesn't doubt. Get around podcasts and YouTube videos that don't show doubt and build your faith up. But be in the right place. Second thing I want to bring out from this is that Thomas's doubt was natural. It was perfectly natural. In fact, you, you can probably imagine if you were in the same boat, you came in, um, having just popped out to the shops, and everyone in, in the house is saying, hey, guess what? We just saw a dead man. You'd be thinking to yourself, mm, nah, I'm not quite sure I want to believe that. <laughs> so, you know, it's completely understandable that Thomas didn't believe. Completely natural, you might say, from a world point of view. And yet Jesus confronts this and he says to him, stop doubting and believe. In fact, throughout Jesus' ministry, he said numerous times about, you know, oh, you have little faith, you know, and, and why do you have faith and all this stuff. And he highlighted people who did have faith and pointed out how great he thought it was, like the centurion. So it's quite natural to feel doubt and we can we can console ourselves by saying, okay, it's, it's natural, it's natural. But if Jesus wants us to not have doubt, where, where's, this, where's this kind of coming? How, how do we move from, from not having doubt to having faith? Sorry, from having doubt to having faith. And um, <clears throat> the Bible describes this battle between our natural self, and the Bible calls it our flesh, and our spiritual self. The Bible tells us to live by the spirit, not the flesh. So our flesh might have doubts, but our spirit has faith. Galatians 5, verse 16 to 18 says, So I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Thomas was presented with a choice to believe. Uh, you know, he, had, he had a choice of, do I believe what is natural to believe? Or do I put my faith in something I can't see? Something that is supernatural. Verse 29, Jesus says, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe i believe actually that this is the whole point of this passage you see if you go back to the first part of the passage jesus it says there uh, it says that uh, after he said this he showed them his hands and feet so he actually showed the other disciples here's my hands 
See the scars. Here's my side. He showed them. So Thomas is a, isn't um, any worse than them. They've had the evidence. They've seen the fact, the truth. OK, Thomas hadn't seen it. And that's why he doubted. But Jesus is saying here for our benefit. These disciples, they saw me. Like They know for a fact they saw with their eyes. In fact, it doesn't take much faith to believe something you've seen with your eyes. But you, you right now in 2020, who have never seen Jesus for yourself, you've never seen the scars, you've never seen the, the, where the spear went into his side, you've never seen that, but yet you believe. Jesus is happy with that. Just blessed are you who believe and haven't seen. That's what faith is all about. We know this from Hebrews 11 verse 1. It says, now faith is being sure, certain, sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now this you might think is a difficult thing, but you do it every day. Right now, every day you're washing your hands like crazy. Why? Because you, you look at your hands and you think, well, there could be virus. If I've been in contact with someone or something and the virus has been passed to me, they could be on these hands. You can't see the virus, but you have faith that if it was there, you still wouldn't be able to see it. For all you know, you're looking at your hand and you're thinking the virus is there. Now, <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is this. You believe in a virus that you can't see. It's exactly the same. That's what faith is. It's being certain. It's believing in something that you can't see. It's going against your natural self. And that battle between your natural self and your spiritual self and choosing, I'm going to land on the side of the spiritual self. The third thing I want to bring out of this text is that it became very personal to Thomas. When Jesus speaks to him, Thomas says, my Lord and my God. It's very personal. To me. You know, the people in my life that I trust the most, people like Leah, my wife, like people like my mum and dad, my brothers and sisters-in-law, you know, those people who I trust the most. Why do I trust them the most? I trust them the most because I know they love me. And right now in this moment, Thomas is realising it's really him. It's really Jesus. It's really the guy who I know loves me. I trust him. I've spent time with him. I spent you know, years with him, following him around, discussing things, laughing with him, joking with him. I know this person and it's really him. I can trust him because I, I know he loves me. And I want to say that to you right now. You can trust God. You can get rid of doubt and put your faith in him. Why? Because you know that he loves you and he does. We know this because of what it tells in the Bible. Uh, in 1 John 4 verse 7 to 16 it says, Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his son and his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit and we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the saviour of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God, uh, on the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever lives, uh, whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. God loves you today. Maybe someone needs to hear that a little bit more than normal. God loves you. It goes on to say in other parts of the Bible, like Joshua 1 verse 9, it says, Be strong and courageous. Not, uh, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God, who loves you, because he's your God who loves you, will be with you wherever you go. 
you can trust in him. He's with you always. He loves you. Romans 8.31 If God is for us, who can be against us? You can put your faith in him. You can stop doubting and have faith if you know that God loves you and he's with you. You know, this is hard for some people to grasp because they don't feel like they're lovable. They don't feel worthy. They don't feel like they're valuable. I want to tell you, that's not how God sees you. Um, you know, when if I ever burn my toast, <laughs> this is a daft illustration, but just go with it. If I ever burn my toast, you know, um, I know, right, that um, I look at that toast and I think, is it, is it salvageable? And I know that if I put enough marmalade on that toast, if I cover that toast with marmalade, I won't even know it's burnt. <laughs> this is how God's love works for you. You might think you're the worst person in the world, but God sent his son, Jesus, to die on a cross. And his blood covers over a multitude of sins, the Bible says. When God looks at you, he just sees perfection. He just sees everything that his son is. He just All that stuff is taken away from you. You have worth, you have value, because God says that you do. And so you can rely on that and rest in the fact that God loves you. So I <clears throat> just want to give you a couple of things just to think about or put in practice to or apply to your life uh, before I finish with you. The first thing is this, when you face with a choice to doubt or to have faith, I want you to walk forward. Walk forward, just like I did on that walk where I took a step. Take a step in faith. It might be that you're stepping into something that's unseen, unknown, unproven, untested. You don't know the outcome. But take a step in faith. With certainty of what you hope for and on what you don't see. Just take a step. Just one step. And they'll see that doubt go behind you. And then take another step. And another step. And another step. And another, another step. And don't let those doubt thoughts come in and creep in. Just take a step at a time. Keep trusting him. Secondly, when you're faced with a choice, remember, always remember that God is your God. You're loved. He loves you. And he wants you to take that step of faith because he's there ready. And if you do something wrong, he's there ready to catch you when you fall. He loves you. He's your heavenly father. So remember that in those moments where you, where doubt's creeping in. Doubt about whether God loves you. Doubt, doubt about whether you can do something. Doubt about whether God's speaking to you. Take a step of faith in the unseen. Go for it. And do it knowing that God loves you. And you're safe in that. 